This Christmas season, we're focusing on Luke chapter 2, 8 through 16. Those verses tell the story of the angels making an announcement to the shepherds in the fields outside of Bethlehem. Their announcement is that a Savior has been born. The angels tell the shepherds that this is good news of great joy for all people. Today, we want to look at how the herald angels sing a song of joy. Take your Bibles this morning. Let's turn to the book of Luke, Luke chapter 2. We started last week um, a three-week series. We're calling the Herald Angels Sing. We're focusing on the angels' song as the angels come and make an announcement to the shepherds about Jesus' birth And we want to read that passage of Scripture today to start off with. This will be from Luke 2. We're going to start in verse 8 and read down through verse 16. In that same region of Bethlehem, there were shepherds out in the field keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest. And on earth, peace among those with whom he is pleased. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And those shepherds went with haste, and they found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. Last week when we gathered together, we read this same exact passage, and we focused last week on verse 14, where the angels sing, that they, they're saying glory to God in the highest, peace on earth, goodwill toward men. And we talked last week about the angels singing a song of peace. The fact that the angels have come announcing the fact that Jesus has come to bring not peace among men, right? But peace with sinful man and holy God. He's come to bring peace there. Today we want to focus really in on verse number 10 where the angels say, Behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. The herald angels sing today a song of joy. We want to focus today on this idea of joy. And when the angels come and make this announcement about Jesus being born, it's an announcement of joy. Just like any other time, this announcement is about a baby. And when you get announcements about babies, most of the time, it's a joyful thing, right? I remember when Amy told me about the fact that we were going to have the boys. I can remember where we were, and I remember what I was doing, and I remember, you know what I mean? It's, a, it's an exciting thing. It's a terrifying thing, but it's exciting, right? It's, it's exciting. that you already, you already, You're thinking about um, that. There's like an initial excitement, and then you're thinking about what it's gonna, how it's going to change your life, and you're thinking about this kid's going to be watching everything. I mean, like in the, in the five minutes after she tells you that, right, you're thinking about this kid's going to be watching everything I'm doing. I'm going to screw this kid up. You think about the kid as an adult living in a gutter somewhere with a needle hanging out of his arm, and it's your fault, and the kid hadn't even been born yet. You only learned five minutes ago that... You know, and, and you're, you're just, you, you, you're so worried about it all, right? But the truth is, is that it's extremely joyful as you think about that and you prepare for that baby. And then I think about when the baby was born. I think about all the family and friends and the people that we had at the hospital and how there was, a, I mean, you know, it was, like a, it was like a party in that waiting room, you know, and it's a lot of fun waiting for that baby to come. There's joy there. There's joy in those grandparents' faces when you roll that 
cart out to the nursery, you know, and they get to see that little grandbaby, you know, there's excitement there. I think about it in Amy's face, right? I think about the, that, that during, that, um, during that labor part, I guess, of the delivery, you know, and she's so, you know, you're in pain and it's not fun. And then like that, they hand her that baby and it's no more pain. It's no more, it's joy. It's joy. This announcement of this baby's birth is no different. It is a joyful announcement. Jesus' birth is a reason for celebration and joy. Now, today I'm going to talk about some of those reasons, but I want us to think for a moment about kind of the same vein that we did last week when we think about peace. The way that the world perceives peace is not the kind of peace that he came to bring. And the way that we perceive joy, the way the world perceives joy, remember, the problem with the angels song is we're familiar with it. We've heard people sing it. We've heard kids recite it in Christmas plays. We've heard someone read the Christmas story. And so our first mistake with this song is, is that we're familiar with it. But the second mistake we make with this is we misinterpret it. And so when the angels sing that they have good news of great joy, which will be for all people, what are they singing about? Let's work through it like this. Let's start with this. So we talk about this good news of great joy for all people. Let's start by talking about the joy of the season. When we think about Christmas, we think about a joy that comes along with this time of the year, right? Even if we don't use the word joy, like a lot of times we do, right? You've seen those ladies with sweatshirts on it. You know, it's been cricketed out and it's got some kind of little thing on it, you know? Joy just says one word joy on it. You have a Christmas ornament, it just says joy on it. it. But even if we don't use that word exactly, we say things like this, Merry Christmas. Now think for just a minute about what we're saying. Because that phrase, Merry Christmas, has been around a long time. It goes all the way back to the 1500s. It was in common use. You'd find it right and then the song that we even sing today. We wish you a Merry Christmas. We wish you. 1500s, right? It's all introduced in the 1500s. When you think about this idea of Merry Christmas, we still say that, but that's really kind of an old expression, right? I mean, Merry Christmas has hung on a little bit because of like Charles Dickens and a Christmas Carol and a lot of our traditions, frankly, the Christmas traditions that we have, most of them are holdovers from that Victorian era, and that idea of Merry Christmas, when we use that phrase, it's kind of an old-sounding thing, isn't it? We don't say Happy Christmas. We say Happy Birthday, Happy Anniversary, Happy Easter, Merry Christmas. Why is that? Well, some people say Happy Christmas. You know the, you know the British say Happy Christmas, right? As, um, as it turns out, um, happy is a higher, is a higher class word. And that's what the queen wishes to the people. She, wishes, she doesn't wish them a merry. Merry is like um, merry making. It's rowdy. It's raucous. That's what low class people do. <laughs> happy is high class. And so the queen has for years wished her citizens happy Christmas. And that's why it kind of goes on there, right? The, for, the royal family's formal greeting is happy Christmas, not merry Christmas. But now you and I say merry Christmas. And it's almost this idea, happy and merry, they're two different words, right? Happy is like an emotion that we feel. Merry almost describes the kind of behavior that we have. It's like uh, overflowing, joyous, bubbly, right? In the same way that merry and happy are two different words, so is joy and happiness. And if you were in Sunday school this morning, we talked about that, right? We know that happiness is this temporary, it's an emotion that we feel, but it is generally temporary, and it is most often based on the circumstances that are around us. If the circumstances are good, if everybody's in a good mood, if somebody has told you good news, you feel happy. But now joy is different. Joy is deeper, it's longer lasting, it's more permanent. It is not based on outward circumstances, it is something deep and abiding. And the angels did not come and say, we have good news of happiness. They didn't come and say, we have good news that's going to make you real merry. They say, we have good news of great joy, abiding, lasting, good. This emotion, this feeling based on something more than current circumstances. 
And when we think about Christmas, it is a thing of joy, right? When we talked about that in Sunday school this morning, we talked about the anticipation of things to come, the way that kids are counting down the days to Christmas. And there's this anticipation of of what Santa Claus is going to bring and how happy we'll be, you know, that Christmas morning kind of joy, right? There's a joy where you... um, Well, not this year, but you know in years past when you would get together with your family and you would have Christmas, you know that, you know? We're going to get together, I think, at some point. But um, this is a side note. This isn't even, I don't even know why I'm telling you this, but I'm fixing to go off into it. I was telling you this morning, you remember a couple years ago, remember we were all, there was a war for Christmas, you know what I mean? You couldn't say Merry Christmas. You had to say Happy Holidays or Season's Greetings or whatnot. You couldn't say Merry Christmas. That was offensive. And there was a war on Christmas, and you couldn't have a nativity scene outside the courthouse because there was a war on Christmas. And like this year, there really is a war on Christmas. Like they've literally taken it away for millions of people in this country, right? You can't get together with anybody for Christmas, right? They've really, really taken it away. This idea of Christmas, this joy that you would feel when you used to get together with your family at Christmas and celebrate that idea of being around each other and just the fun. Like My memories of Christmas are not altogether Christmas related, right? And when I think back to Christmases that I've spent at grandparents' house or whatever else, your, your, your joy and your happiness is not necessarily the, the Christmas stuff. It's the stupid thing your cousin did. It's the silly thing your aunt said. You know what I'm talking about? Like, it's the joy of being around each other. Like, we have that kind of joy at Christmas, right? That kind of happiness. There's also this idea that you have given something, you've chosen something to give to another, and you're waiting for them to open it up because you can't wait to see their face when they open it up. And they, they've been waiting for that. They, they've asked for it or they, it's something they really want or something they've wanted for a long time or something they didn't even know that they wanted. But when they open it, they're going to realize that they wanted this and this is an awesome thing that you have picked out for them. And when they unwrap it then and you're waiting, you're just waiting for them to open it. And when they do, that look on their face. Everybody knows what I'm talking about, right? This is when we think, we tend to think about the joy of Christmas. This is what we're thinking about. That when, when, if I just say that term, that's most like, and none of those things are wrong. It's like the piece that we talked about last week. None of those things are wrong. It's great when you have Christmas morning and all is merry and bright. That's good, isn't it? But that's not the, that's not the joy that the angels are singing about. That's not the joy that we're talking about here. What the angels are singing about is a joy that is found in the Christ child. It's a joy that's found when the shepherds hear this news, there is joy that comes to them, and there is joy that comes to me and you when this announcement is made for you and I. This news that the angels shared was joyful. The Life Application Commentary says this, This news, the news the angels are sharing, comprised everything for which the Jews had been hoping and waiting. The Savior for them had come. You see, the shepherds were Jewish guys. They had been living in this culture that had been waiting for a Messiah. They had heard the promises that God had promised a Messiah, and they had been waiting. And it was joyful news to hear that the Messiah was finally here. We talked about this morning in Sunday school, you know, that 400 years of silence between, where God didn't, God didn't speak. There was no message for the people between the Old Testament and the New Testament, that 400 years between there. And we talked about how many false messiahs, how many people claimed themselves to be Messiah as the Jewish people were waiting for that. And how many people were, how many people were disappointed when that person turned out to be nothing more than a charlatan? How many times did people get their hopes up How many people, when they saw Jesus, thought he was one of these? But if you're a shepherd in a field and the angels burst on the scene, this isn't your next-door neighbor telling you rumors about a Messiah or ladies down at the beauty shop. These are angels from heaven making announcement of good news, of great joy for all people. Christ, the Christ child, the Messiah that you have longed for is born today. Tonight, right now in the city of Bethlehem, right here in this same region with you, the Messiah is born to you today. You remember the shepherds, it says in verse 16 that they go, and in, like in verse 16, they went with haste, which means they were excited and joyful. They found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. Then go down to verse 20 if you've still got your Bibles open. The shepherds returned after they left that 
manger scene. The shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told to them. For as a Jewish person to know that the Messiah was here, that was a message of joy. But listen to what the angels sang. Because if you just listen to what, if you listen to what the angels sing and you're just thinking about it in Jewish terms, you've missed something. Listen to what the angels say. This is good news of great joy for all people. Not just Jews. It's not just good news for those of you that have been waiting for a Messiah. This is good news of great joy for all people. This is a message that is for you and me. I'll tell you a phrase that's interested me this week. Um, let's look at 10 and 11. If you've got your Bibles open, look to there, 10 and 11. Verse 10 is where they say that about great joy. Good news I bring to you of great joy that will be for all people. Then verse 11 is the news. For unto you is born this day in the city of David. Did you hear what I just read? Isn't it interesting that the angel did not say, for unto Mary is born this day in the city of David. See, if you hear the news, like if you go back to when Amy told me that we were going to have the boys, if you, were, if you were our friends, if you were our family, and somebody told you, oh, David and Amy are having a baby. Amy had the baby the other day. It wouldn't be this idea that we had a baby. They don't say born unto Mary. They say born unto you this day. This baby has been born for you. He's come for you. Shepherds, he's come for you. If you're reading this text, if you're hearing this promise, this is the reason that it is for joy. It is a message of joy that we have to share because this baby that has come has been born for us. He's been born to live as we live. He's been tempted in all manner like me and you, and he came to die for me and you without sin in order that you and I might be right with God. This is a reason for joy. This is the message that we have to share. As I was reading this week, John R. Rice talks about that message. He says, look, the preacher, the Sunday school teacher, the personal soul winner, the seminary professor ought to always remember that this is not a dry as dust theology. This is a glorious, heartwarming, soul-rejoicing thing we deal with when we teach the Word of God and preach the gospel. This Christmas message is not dry as dust theology. It is soul-warming, soul-rejoicing news to hear that holy God and sinful man can be reconciled to each other through the birth of this little baby, this, uh, as Neil would say it, this unassuming yet bold move that happens is Christ being born in the flesh, God being born in the flesh among us, and this is a reason for joy. It should not be matter of fact. It should be real and joyful in our heart that he has come. It is, Christ is, the joy for the season. It's not just getting together with family, and it's not about the presence, and it's not about the anticipation and the lights and the fun and the merrymaking. It's joy that we have in him because of what he has done for us. Let's talk about that. That kind of describes the joy of the season, but let's talk a little bit about the joy we have in salvation. There's a joy to be had in salvation. Just as we discussed last week, when we have peace with God, when, when we're right with our maker, and there's peace with God, we also have the peace of God in our hearts, right? We have the peace of God in us. This is true for you and I. When we come to know Christ, he puts joy unspeakable here. We have the joy of Christ in our hearts, and we should be joyful people. Salvation in itself is a joyous thing, isn't it? Do you remember the day that you were saved? Do you remember the time that you were saved? Do you remember ever telling anybody about what had happened to you and being happy about it? Do you remember, maybe if you were a child, do you remember calling your grandparents or telling a friend and being excited about the thing that had happened to you? Salvation in Christ is a joyful thing in your own heart. But you know, salvation, when a person is saved, it's a joyful thing in the life of the church, isn't it? 
Like we're motivated and, and inspired it, when we see a person come to Christ and they're saved and they're baptized and we see them growing in the Lord. That's a great thing and it's a thing that causes joy in our hearts and motivate us, motivates us and spurs us forward. But you know what the Bible says? The Bible says not only is there joy in the heart of the one who's saved and in the life of the church as they see them saved, but there's joy in heaven. You know that verse? This is in Luke 15 and verse 7. Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. As I've heard preachers talk about that through the years and a person being saved in this joyful shout in heaven that comes as a result of this. That God's work has been done. If you think about Christ dying on the cross, he was placed into the tomb. He rose again on the third day and the news of his resurrection brought joy. Remember the disciples leaving the tomb? This is in Matthew 28 in verse 8. This is the ladies that came. They came, they saw Jesus was raised, and they departed quickly from the tomb, and they had fear and great joy. And they ran to tell the disciples what had happened. His work, his finished work on the cross, his death, burial, and resurrection that brings about our salvation is cause for joy. In looking at this idea of, of new life that comes to Christ, they had joy in his resurrection. It's the same kind of joy we experience in our own hearts, in the life of the church, in the, life, uh, in the, in the halls of heaven. This person has been brought from death to life. It is a resurrection of sorts. It is a resurrection into new life. And that's a cause for rejoicing, for celebration. 1 Peter 1, starting in verse 8, it says this. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. This is a thing that is inexpressible. It's inexpressible joy. We can't even express the kind of joy that we have in Christ. Psalm 92 in verse 4 says this, For you, O Lord, you have made me glad by your work. At the work of your hands, I sing for joy. When I, when I see what you have done in me, when I see how you're working in the life of my family or my church, when I see how you change lives, when, you're, when I see your work, it is a cause for joy in my own life. If all of that is true, if his salvation brings about joy in our heart, and when we see others grow and respond to him, that brings about joy. If all, of that, if all of that salvation produces joy, then why are Christians so dreary? My dad used to talk about this idea of um, Christians proclaiming or saying that they have Christ and the joy in their heart, and then his expression is, then they walk around like a Missouri mule that's been eating briars for a month. <laughs> it's kind of a vivid picture, isn't it? <laughs> like, that's the way we look? As a believer in Christ Jesus, we are to be people of joy. It's just the way it is. Now, I want you to hear me very clearly. Christian joy is not the power of positive thinking. Christian joy is not having a bubbly and award-winning personality. That's not what Christian joy is. Christian joy is not walking through life with a half-glass-full, naive view about life. Right? That's not what it is. It's not what Christian joy is. But when they look at us, they should see the joy that we have in Christ. This idea of Christian joy is rooted in the truth of the gospel. The fact that holy God has made a way for sinful man to be reconciled to him is a cause for joy. The very fact that God has made peace with us through his death, burial, and resurrection of his son. The fact that he offers salvation to us and he promises us a home in heaven. All of these things are reason to be joyful. And yet, when people ask how we're doing, we complain about our health.
We have eternal life. We, we're spiritually dead, and we have been made alive in Christ, and we're going to go to heaven to be with him. None of this stuff is going to matter, and we're going to be there with him. And yet we get upset about what they say, whether it's true or not. It causes us despair and distress, and we lose our joy. And a thousand years from now, if you're a believer, a thousand years from now, that ain't even going to be a, a faint memory. You will be with him. This is the joy that we have. This idea that you and I were dead in our trespasses and sin, this idea that you and I were hopeless and helpless and there was nothing that we could do about it, and he reached down from glory and he took us in, he, he called us out of all of that, and he has made us a, a child of God. We are his. And yet, we seem so miserable to a world that needs the joy that we know that we have, yet we keep hidden in him. You and I are to be people of joy. And if they don't see us as that, if we are not people of joy, when, when we don't express joy to this lost world, we don't express Christ to this lost world. We don't show Christ to them. They're not seeing him in us. But if we have him, we have joy. Jonathan Edwards said this, The enjoyment of God is the only happiness with which our souls can be satisfied. To go to heaven to fully enjoy God is infinitely better than the most pleasant accommodations here. Fathers and mothers, husbands and wives, children, or the company of earthly friends are but shadows, but God is the substance. These are but scattered beams. God is the sun. These are but streams, but God is the ocean. Like all of those, all of those things about Christmas that bring us joy, the presents and the fun and the faces and the, all that stuff are scattered beams, and he is the sun. Our joy is in him. It is infinitely greater and bigger than all of that. When we are overjoyed by him, uh, the Bible also, I believe, teaches that when we have him, the principle here is, is that when we have him and we are overjoyed in him, we're not tempted to sin. Matthew Henry said, Joy in the Lord will guard you from the empty pleasures the tempter uses to bait his hooks. Imagine that you have just had a really big Christmas meal. And then I think about something I forgot to pull out. And I go get it out of the refrigerator and I say, oh, I forgot to bring this out. Anybody want some of this? And you say to me, I could not eat another bite. I'm stuffed. I'm totally full. See, this is the idea. The idea is, is that when we have joy in Christ, as a Christian, when we're living in the joy of Christ and we're relishing in the joy of him, we are finding all of the satisfaction that we need in Christ and we don't need whatever is tempting us to fill the void. He fills it. He fills it. We're satisfied in him. We can say, I got all I need. I don't need a bite of that because I'm fully satisfied in him. There is joy in Christ. I don't need anything else. This is what it is to have the joy of Christ. And because we have Christ, we have every reason to be joyful. This joy that we have comes from our salvation in him. You have the joy of the season and there's joy in salvation, but let me give you one more. The Bible even takes it a step further and says that we can have joy in suffering. The Bible says that even our joy in Christ, because it is not happiness and it is not based on circumstances and it is not something fleeting or passing that comes because we have Christ and, and, and our Lord is the same yesterday, today, and forever, that we have a joy that is the same. Yesterday, today, 
and forever. And no matter what the circumstances are outwardly, the joy that we have in him remains. It's to still be on display to a world who needs him, no matter what our outward circumstances are, because he's Lord in our heart. Because we have a satisfaction, a fulfillment in him, and this is a thing that no one can take away from you. John 16 and 22, Jesus speaking to his disciples said, So also you have sorrow now, but I will see you again, and your hearts will rejoice, and no one will take that joy from you. People can't take that joy away from you. The uh, COVID ban your uh, Christmas police can't take that away from you. The, no one can. No one can take that joy from you. The outward circumstances, the bad diagnosis, the financial problems, you name it. You go right down the line. None of those things can take this joy from you because they don't take him from you. And he's the source of the joy. That's why Paul's able to write to the Philippians, and he says in Philippians 4.4, 4, Rejoice in the Lord always. Always, and it's like Paul knew that the, the put that back up, Mark. Put that, put that one back up. Put, put Philippians 4, 4 back up because we need that in just a minute. It's like Paul knew that the Philippians were going to say, always. It's like he writes it, rejoice in the Lord always. And it's like he knew they're going to read this and they're going to say, okay, I get it when the baby's born. I get it when things are good. But Paul, you're telling me I'm to rejoice Always. Again, I say, rejoice. I didn't stutter. I didn't say it in another language. Very plainly, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say, just in case you're confused, rejoice. Always? Yes, always. Even in the bad times. We're not rejoicing over the bad things. We're rejoicing in spite of them because we have Christ. And the Bible even tells us over and over again that those trials are going to come, and when they come, we're to be joyful in them. Look at some of these verses. This is James 1 in verse 2. Count it all joy, my brothers, when various trials, all kind of trials come your way. Count it joy. How about this one? This is from Psalm 4, 6 and 7. This is good. I need this verse this week. There are many who say... Who will show us some good? Lift up the light of your face upon us, O Lord. You have put more joy in my heart than they have when their grain and wine abound. Do you see that? Where's the goodness in God? Who's going to show us why in this bad thing it's good to be joyful? And the response to that was, look, God, I don't need joy in outward circumstances Because I have more joy than they do when their grain and their wine abound. The person who's prosperous over there, I have more joy in the Lord than they have in their prosperity. I don't need that kind of prosperity to be joyful because I have him. Prosperity is not wrong. You understand? Prosperity and and financial security and and none of those things are wrong. But it's not the source, it's not the basis of the joy that we have. That's in him. And because that's the truth, the pauper can be more joyful than the prince. Because we we know what we have in Christ. One of my favorites is Habakkuk 3. Habakkuk 3, starting at the end of that. Listen to this imagery, this is good. Though the fig tree should not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines... The produce of the olive may fail and the fields yield no food. The flock may be cut off from the fold and there be no herd in the stalls. Everything I've read up until this point, even if none of that applies to you, everything is going wrong. If if the wheels fall, if every one of the wheels fall off, verse 18 says, Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. God, the Lord, is my strength, and he makes my feet like the deer's. He makes me tread on high places. You know those nimble deer? You know those those nimble feet? 
Lord, you make my feet nimble like the deer. And when the bad things come along, when all the wheels fall off, I don't slip and fall. I'm able to grab and hold on and to attain heights with you in trial, in suffering, in adversity that others can't find. When the, when the blossom blooms and when the herds are in the field and when the flocks prosper, when the wine and grain abound, it's Christ. Christ is what, what, where our joy comes from. And the truth is, is that if you and I are walking through days that are like Habakkuk 3.17, where all the wheels are coming off, we still have room to be joyful because Christ never leaves us, never forsakes us. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And the truth of the salvation that has been produced in our heart because of what he has done does not change. We are reconciled to him we are sanctified and being sanctified in him. And one day we will be glorified to him. And none of this stuff will matter. Not a bit of it. And that's a cause for joy. You know this. But it's a good picture of what I'm talking about with joy. I said, David, this is, this is Christmas. And I get it. Okay, joy to the world, all that jazz. I get it. But joy, this is what you're preaching about on Christmas? Joy? Why is that so important? Why does it matter whether I'm happy or not, joyful or not, to this world? Mining, coal mining, is especially dangerous work. One of the reasons that makes it dangerous is because of the gases that can build up while all that mining's happening. You know, if you uh, like carbon monoxide, you may have a carbon monoxide detector in your house, but if that carbon monoxide builds up, everybody falls over, and there's no getting anybody out. Methane, if, if there's a methane buildup, there can be a spark and an explosion. It can kill all kind of miners. And long ago, these dangers were known about coal mining. And so in kind of like the early days of that coal mining, there was a very effective and low-tech solution that they found. And many of you know what it was. They would take little canaries down into the mine tunnels with them. And those little canaries would sing and hop around and do. Now, if they weren't singing and hopping around, then you got trouble, right? Right? As long as they're singing and, and they're ju jumping from their perch to the floor of that cage, everything's good. But because they're so sensitive to the, to the toxins in the air, if the bird stops singing, it gets a little wobbly on that perch and hits the ground. It's a detector. It tells the miner, this isn't affecting you yet. But if you just keep going, it's going to. And you're not going to be any different than the bird in the cage. And this low-tech solution was used to save people's lives so that those gases did not kill them. Joy in the life of a Christian, joy in the life of a person, is a canary in a coal mine. It is a detector about where you stand with him. You know, we talked about last week this idea. We talked about that if you know Christ, K-N-O-W, if you know Christ, then you know peace, right? But if you have no Christ, N-O Christ in your life, you have N-O no peace in your life. The same is true of joy. If you know Christ, you have joy. You may hide it, you may repress it, you may lose it and forget about it for a while, but you have it. But if you don't know Christ, you don't know joy. So as a barometer, as a detector, you may be here today and you may, you may say, David, my life is not marked by joy. I, I get what you're saying. I mean, I have happiness at Christmas, David, but the truth is, is that even during those times when I even am looking happy, 
take a good look at my face. You know that one? That's a, who's that? Smokey Robinson? You'll see the tracks of my tears, you know. I may be the life of the party. I may be whatever else, but you just look at me and you can tell I'm sad. Even in the middle of all that, you may not feel joy in your heart. No joy. Because there's no Christ. You may say, David, I, I don't know what you're talking about. This joy that you're talking about in salvation, I, I don't know that. I don't know what it is to have joy in Christ. And I certainly couldn't have joy in my suffering. Are you kidding me? No joy. No Christ. It could be a detector. It could be a canary for you today to say, if you don't know joy, if you don't know what that joy is, to know that no matter what happens here, everything is solid and secure and right with Christ. In a minute, we're going to sing a song, and, and we're going to have time for people to come to this altar and pray. And here's what I'm going to ask you to do. If you're here today and you don't know him as Lord and Savior, you, you can't go back in your mind to a time when you've trusted him, you've surrendered your life to him, and you certainly know that you don't have joy as a, as a persistent characteristic in your life. Then I'm going to ask you to come today. Take me by the hand. Come and kneel in this altar and say to me, David, I don't have that joy you're talking about. I need to talk to somebody about that joy that's found in Christ. I'm not going to put you on the spot. I'm not going to call you out. I, what I want to do is I want to get somebody who can take God's word and sit down with you one-on-one, -on -one, not in here, not in front of everybody. Get somewhere alone and talk about that. Talk about your relationship with Christ and make sure that things are right between you and him. I'd love to do that today, to leave here today knowing that you have the joy of Christ in your heart. But the truth is, you could be a believer in Jesus Christ and today feel no joy in your heart remember it's a canary in a coal mine it's an it's a detector and the truth is is that when we wander away from Christ one of the first things that happens as a Christian is we lose our joy in him there's biblical proof of this David didn't go to war, but he stayed at home. And you remember his affair with Bathsheba? He had an affair with a married woman. He got her pregnant, tried to cover it up, killed her husband. It was like a, you know, in our day it would be like it would be on all the news networks. It was political scandal, right? Tried to cover it up. The prophet Nathan comes in, and prophet Nathan's the whistleblower. He's the one that comes in and says, shame on you, king. This is you. You have done this. You've sinned in the sight of God. David, thankfully, doesn't deny all the charges. David is repentant. And he writes Psalm 51 as this prayer of confession to God. Listen to what he writes in Psalm 51. I'm gonna, the verses will be up on the screen, and I'm only going to choose certain ones from the psalm, the ones that are most pertinent to this discussion. But look at what David says. Have mercy on me, O God. According to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. God, I've screwed up, and I need you to help me. I need you to, with your mercy and your love, blot out those sins. Verse 2, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a right spirit within me. Look at verse 12. And restore to me the joy of your salvation. See, it wasn't that David didn't trust in God. He did. But David had a momentary lapse where he wandered away from God and the relationship was not the same. There wasn't that same closeness. I know that all of the marriages in this room are perfect. And you never have moments where you're at odds with one another. Okay, I, I know you guys and I know that that's not true. But most marriages, most marriages, if you've been married for any length of time, you know that when it comes to the closeness and the intimacy between a husband and a wife, aren't there moments where it's... And when you're in one of these down here, this rediscovery of the love for your spouse renews a joy in that marriage. I'm told. <laughs> I 
it renews this joy in your marriage, right? It, because, because this idea of you, either this forgetfulness or you've taken for granted or you've wandered apart or whatever it is, right? That's the same way it is in a relationship with the Lord is to fall in love with him all over again and experience the joy that you first had when you were saved and you were excited and the halls of heaven shouted and you called your grandmother and you were so pumped up and you went to school and you told your friends about what had happened to you and you were so excited and you stood in front of your church and you told everybody what happened and you said it boldly and proudly and gladly and everybody was happy for you and there was joy in that moment and you felt like you could charge hell with a water pistol and it was over with, right? You, were, you, you, could, you could do this. And today, you wonder where that feeling went. Could it be that you've wandered away from him and, in turn, lost the joy of your salvation? Others don't see it in you. And you would come today and you would say, Lord, I want to surrender myself to you. I want to fall in love all over again with you. And I want the joy of my salvation to return. I want to be happy and joyful in you. I don't know where you're at today, but I know that Christmas, the birth of not just a baby, the Savior of the world, is good news of great joy for all people. And you're all people. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, say come and they get together a hymn of invitation, something for us to sing. I don't want you to think about anybody else but yourself today. When you think about where you stand with him, try not to be distracted by the things that are happening in the room. Only focus on what's happening right now in your heart. And the question I would ask you in this moment is, can you hear the canary singing? Do you hear the song of joy singing in your heart? Or is it eerily quiet? And I'm going to ask you today that in all honesty, if you can't hear the song of that joyful canary in your heart, I'm going to ask you to evacuate the tunnel of your sin, your indifference, your apathy. I'm going to ask you to come and find safety and rescue in him. Lord, you are a God who inspires us to joy. And Lord, when we don't feel it, we know that we're away from you. And so, Lord, I pray for the one that's here today that's struggling, that's, that's not joyful that, Lord, you would be enough. You would reveal your, the need that they have for you. Lord, I pray that you would encourage them today to take that next step to you. Lord, we love you, and we know that you change hearts, you change lives, and we're grateful for what you do. It's in your name that we pray. Amen.